Good. Wearing the Britney mic today, so hopefully uh, we can get that to work. <laughs> I'll, well, no, I'll try not to dance yet. Yeah. That's fine. Right, well, um, I'm going to be sharing today um, from John, and we're going to be sticking in mainly chapter 9, a little bit before, maybe a little bit after as well. I'm going to ask for our first little activity today, if we could just close our eyes um, for a moment. We're actually going to start today's sermon by having our eyes closed, and we're hopefully going to finish it with our eyes closed as well. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that you have been born blind. You've never been able to see a car coming down the road. You've never been able to see the beauty of the day. Never been able to see a sunrise or sunset. Never been able to look into the eyes of the people that you love. Never been able to see a baby smile or watch them take their first steps. Or even on a practical level, never being able to see someone or something moving towards you or someone reaching out to you. You can open your eyes. Now our story this morning begins with these words in John 9 chapter 1. As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, just like we were saying then, this man had never seen the beauty of day. He'd never seen a sunrise or sunset. He'd never seen the faces of those that he loved. He's never seen what or who was moving towards him. But on this day, all of that is going to change. So let me set the stage. Earlier that day in John 8 verse 12, Jesus had claimed to be the light of the world. And whoever follows him, he says, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, he spoke these words at the end of the Jewish festival called the Feast of Tabernacles. That includes a ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple. So let me explain. The Illumination of the Temple took place when the priests would light the wicks of the four great menorah that were located in the court of the women. Now, if you don't know what a menorah is, it's a candelabrum with nine branches, okay? Nine different candles to light. Now, these particular menorah, these were the big boy menorah, okay? They were huge, okay? And they were so big and so bright. I mean, they were 75 feet tall, okay? Each wick had a 10-gallon bowl of oil for fuel. And they didn't just use a bit of string for the wick. They couldn't, could they? They used old priestly robes for the wicks. That's how big these, uh, these menorah were. And they were, so they were not only big, but they were brilliant as well. As a matter of fact, when they were lit, the Mishnah says that they illuminated every single courtyard in Jerusalem. Every single one. Now think for a second what a courtyard would have been in those days. It was the place of life. It was the place where family and community would come together to live life. So as long as these menorah were lit, they brought light to your life. And that light represented the Shekinah glory of God, the unique presence and glory of God that manifested itself in the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness and into the promised land. So when the priests lit these menorah, it was an invitation. An invitation to every single person to walk in the light of God. Now let's not miss this, okay? It's at the end of this ceremony, after those candles have been extinguished, that Jesus stands up and proclaims that he, not some candlestick, but he is the light of the world. He is the Shekinah glory of God. He is the pillar of fire that will lead you through the wilderness and into the promised land. And that's why he says, if you will follow me, you will never walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Jesus is proclaiming that he is the light of God, not just for the Jews, but for the whole world. And he's inviting everyone to follow him. Which, of course, standard doesn't sit very well with the Pharisees. And so they began to challenge him. 
And one challenge leads to another, which leads to another. Until finally, in John 8, 53, he tells them, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. I am. It's that mic drop moment. Boom. The Pharisees and Jews go ballistic. He's boldly and radically claiming to be God. Okay? In their eyes, he's committing blasphemy. The great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The God who created the heavens and the earth. Jesus is claiming to be God. So what did they do? They picked up stones to stone him. And as they do, it says, Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. And then John 9, verse 1, it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, there are two things I want us to notice here. First, even though Jesus is slipping away under the threat of his own death, might I add, don't miss this, he still notices this blind man. Church, I wonder if anyone here has ever questioned, why would Jesus, why would God notice me? You know, why would God pay attention to me in the midst of the chaos of this world, the craziness of the world? Why would God be concerned about me? Well, let me ask you something. When you really love somebody, I mean, when you truly, truly love somebody, do you notice them? Do you pay attention to them? Are you concerned about them? This is where you nod. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Church, your heavenly father notices you. He pays attention to you. And he cares about you because he loves you. It's that simple. Now, because he loves you, he's concerned about what you believe about him. Now, I might jump around a little bit, but this is important. Let's not miss the timing of this scene. So Jesus has been forced out of the temple. Why? Because people have rocks in their hands, and they're annoyed, and they're ready to stone him. Okay? But why? Because they think he's committing blasphemy. And why again? Because he's made multiple claims to be God. He claimed to be the light of the world, the Shekinah glory of God that walks among us, the great I Am, who met with Moses in the burning bush. And so he slips away. But as he does, he leaves them with a sign, a living testimony of who he is, of his deity. In essence, he's saying, all right, if you won't believe my words, then believe this. And he gives them a sign. He opens the eyes of a man who's been born blind. So let's go back to the scene in verse 2. When the disciples see this man who's been born blind, they ask Jesus a question. Now, a question that at first might seem rather cruel. They say, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Who sinned? Now, before you and I jump down the throats of these disciples, remember, they are simply repeating what they have learned. You see, most of their lives, they've been taught by the rabbis that a fetus inside the womb could sin and that the kick of the unborn child was actually evidence for that sin. But really, the truth is all of this was based on a misunderstanding, really, and probably an over-spiritualization of a verse in Genesis 4 that says that sin lies at the door. So they've been taught that sin lay at the door of birth. Now, the disciples had also been taught from the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, that God visits the iniquity of the parents upon the children to the third and fourth generations. And you can see that in Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Numbers 14, if you want some verses to look at. Now, church, this is true, isn't it? We've all seen it, probably. We've all seen the sins of the mothers and fathers impact upon their children. I mean, every day in the world we live in right now, babies are born with defects or drug addictions because their parents have abused drugs, sex, or alcohol. And every day, children suffer 
because of physical or emotional or sexual or relational abuse or dysfunction. Because their parents have inflicted it on them. And so every day the iniquities or the consequences of parental sins are visited upon their children, are impacting on their children. But hear this this morning and hear it well. That does not mean that your child or mine or any child out there will ever be punished by God for things that we've done. Now there may be consequences that they'll suffer, but they will not be punished by God for your sin or mine. Why is that? Because each of us is accountable for our own sin. God does not punish our kids or children for things that we've done. And, you know, I thank God for that. Now, as the disciples pause and look at this blind man, I think what bothers me most about their reaction when I was reading this is that they seem to see him not primarily as a person in need, okay, someone who needs love, care, compassion, but they see him as kind of like a case study, a theological riddle maybe, or a theological object lesson. You know, how many times have we seen these American hospital dramas where the doctor rushes in to the, to the room with his intern sort of rushing behind him? And the interns go up, they pick up the charts, they, they look at the numbers and the graphs, okay, make these assumptions maybe. And it takes the experienced doctor to come in and see the patient as that human being who needs that care and compassion. Church, Jesus did not see this man as some sort of theological riddle. No, he saw him as a man who needed compassion, a person with feelings and hurts and brokenness and bruises on the inside. And deeper than that, he saw him with a spiritual blindness, needing spiritual illumination through faith in Jesus Christ. Which explains why, in verse 3, Jesus gives the disciples this answer. He says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this work, sorry, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Talk about a thankless job. I mean, think about this for a second. Some of us want to sing for God's glory, some of us want to teach for God's glory. Some of us want to serve for God's glory. But how many of us want to be blind for God's glory? How many of us want to suffer for God's glory? Now, don't miss this. This is very important. Jesus doesn't say God brought this man's suffering upon him. No. He says it was. It happened. In other words, he's saying... God has allowed this man's suffering, but he didn't create it. Now, I think this is so important. Don't miss it. God's not, God does not bring our suffering upon us, but hear this. I think there's an economy to God. Okay? God doesn't want to waste anything, even our suffering. So while God doesn't bring our suffering upon us, he does use our suffering for his glory and for our transformation. I bet if I ask for testimonies in here, how many times when we go through the hardest times in life do we see the biggest amount of growth? Sometimes those things happen in life that get us down. But when we turn to God and we work through it with him, we grow the most. Right, back to our scene. So Jesus is looking at this man And speaking to his disciples, he says, God has allowed this to happen so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. So how? How is the work of God going to be displayed? Verse 5, Jesus says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am the Shekinah glory of God that illuminates the lives of people. And verse 6, having said this, he spat on the ground. He made some mud, some healing salve maybe, healing lotion we might call it. 
Now, what is the root word of salvation? It's, it's salve, really. Salvation is God's healing salve, his healing lotion. And so Jesus spits on the ground, makes this healing salve, and he puts it on the eyes of this man. But that healing salve, that healing lotion, like salvation, isn't going to be activated until this man takes a step of faith. His healing is not going to be activated until he takes a step of faith. So Jesus tells him, he says, go. Go activate your healing by washing in the pool of Siloam. Now, we're never told why Jesus put mud on this man's eyes. And we're never told why he sends him to the pool of Siloam. But if you and I are willing to do a little biblical investigation, put our Sherlock Holmes hats on, turn over a few historical rocks, then I think we'll be able to uncover some probable causes. First, it's important to start with what we know. And we know that this man was born blind. He was born blind. Therefore, if Jesus is going to give him sight, this is not a case of simply restoring his sight. Because you can't restore what's never been. So if Jesus is going to give this man sight, then he has to create it. He has to create it. Now, what did God use when he first created man? Jesus. Jesus? Genesis 2, 7. God formed man from what? Yeah, from the dust, from the dirt of the earth. So how do we actually form and shape dirt? Well, dirt's dry, isn't it? So we have to add water. Well, in this case, Jesus added the holiest of all water. It's not very COVID safe, but don't worry, it's Jesus. Okay? Water from his own mouth. The very mouth of God. And he rubbed this wonder-working salve that he had created into this man's eyes. Now, while we're thinking about this, remember that Jesus did not, he never did miracles like in a vacuum on their own. Okay? He always did miracles to communicate a deeper truth about himself. And that's why John calls miracles signs. Signs that point to Christ's deity, to who he was. So when he gives this blind man sight, Jesus does it as a sign, as a living testimony to who he is. He is the light of the world. And those who follow him will never walk in darkness And he is the great I am, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And just as he created Adam out of the dust of the earth, he is now going to create sight in the eyes of this man. Now, I believe there's a reason as well for sending this blind man to the pool of Siloam. And that reason has to do with the Feast of Tabernacles again. Only this time it doesn't have to do with the illumination of the temple those uh, big candlesticks, it has to do with the water ceremony. You see, every day for seven days, the priest would take an empty golden pitcher from the temple and he would make a solemn trip to the Gihon Springs, the Pool of Siloam. And while he made this trip, the choir would sing from Isaiah 12.3 over and over again. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And while they sang that over and over, the priest would go and draw the water from the pool of Siloam, then bring it back to pour over the altar. Now, they did all of this to remind them of how the years before, when they were on the verge of dying from dehydration, in the wilderness, God had provided for them. He had saved them by bringing forth water from a rock. And John 7 verse 37 tells us that Jesus, on the last day of this festival, stood up and he called out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. Now, when he says that, everybody there knows he's offering himself as living water, eternal life, the true way to salvation. 
So I believe that when Jesus sends this man to the pool of Siloam, to the pool that speaks of God's salvation, I believe he's sending him there to remind him that he needs more than just physical sight. He needs spiritual sight. He needs the spiritual salvation and spiritual illumination that only comes when you step out in faith and trust Christ. So the question is, will he do it? Will he step out in faith and trust Christ? Well, verse 7 says he does. He does. He steps out in faith and trusts Christ. And as a result, he comes home healed. He's seeing light for the very first time. He's seeing trees and skies, people and animals for the very first time. Now, when Jesus heals this guy, surely he must have been wonderstruck, amazed, overwhelmed with emotion. Okay, and while he's still caught up in all of this euphoria, he goes home. And what do his neighbors do? Okay, the people he's grown up with. Do they join him in the celebrating? Do they throw him a big party? Do they join in his joy? No, they don't. They actually engage in a debate. Verse 8, his neighbors... And those who had formerly seen him begging said, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, but others claimed he wasn't. Say, no, no, he only looks like this man. Can we believe this? Come on, this guy must have been flying high. He can see, his eyes are opened. He's been healed. He's connecting voices to faces that he's never seen before. But they don't recognize him because they refuse to believe So finally, he gets so frustrated that scripture says he insists, I am the man. I am the man. But they still don't believe. Instead, they say, well, if you are, then tell us how. How were your eyes opened? Come on, tell us how were your eyes opened. Verse 11, he says, the man they called Jesus made some mud. The man they called Jesus took the elements of creation And put it on my eyes. He told me to go to the pool of Siloam. The pool of salvation. And and wash. And wash I did. And when I did, I could see. Oh really? So where is this man, they ask? I don't know. Can you believe this? You know, these people have watched this man trip and grope and feel his way through life since he was a little child. And finally, he gets his sight, and all they want to do is debate, because they don't want to believe. They don't want to. Verse 13, they brought him, or they marched him down maybe to the Pharisees, and evidently after a brief explanation, the Pharisees turn to this man and say, how did you receive your sight? And then in his very straightforward fashion, I love this, verse 15, he says, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. So, is there applause? Can you see the celebration? Is there even a recognition of God's hand and power among these religious so-called leaders? No. Evidently, Jesus had forgotten to consult their little man-made book of healing. (laughs) Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not of God. Why? For he does not keep the Sabbath. Now, church, God's Sabbath law, the only Sabbath law that God commands us to keep, was to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And that's it. That's the law. In other words, on the Sabbath, put your work aside and focus on God and seek God's peace. So let's be clear. Jesus did not break this law. He doesn't break God's law. However, the Pharisees over time had piled up law upon law, upon law, upon God's law. And quite frankly, some of them were just absurd. For example, on the Sabbath, if your sandals had nails in them to hold them together, then you couldn't wear them because carrying nails was considered work. On the Sabbath, you couldn't cut your fingernails or toenails or your hair or even trim your beard like my mum would want me to do because it was considered work. Now, if you wanted to be a good follower, you couldn't 
even make clay because mixing water and dirt was considered construction work. And you couldn't heal unless it was a matter of life and death. So when the Pharisees heard clay and they heard the healing of a blind man, they declared, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And since they were divided, they went back to the blind man and said, what have you to say about him? After all, it was your eyes he opened. And once again, this former blind man responds simply and directly. He says, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. Now, a more controversial answer he could not have given in that moment. Verse 22 says that the Jews had already decided that whoever acknowledges Jesus as the Christ would be excommunicated, kicked out of the synagogue, shut off from the people, and treated as if you were dead. And that's exactly what happened. As soon as this guy declares Jesus is a prophet, as soon as he declares the truth, they had all the evidence they needed to kick him out. And the, verse 34 says they, that's what they did. They kicked him out of the synagogue, put him out on the streets without family or friends. Talk about a day. Think about this. This guy went from being blind to being healed, from being healed to being questioned, from being questioned to being cast out of the synagogue, which means he has no religious leaders, he's got no neighbours, no mum or dad, no brothers or sisters. He doesn't have anybody that wants to stay connected with the synagogue and the rest of the community, community, which means he has no one. He's an outcast. Maybe this morning you've felt like an outcast. Maybe like this blind man, you took a stand for Christ. And people rejected you. Or maybe for whatever reason you feel like your life is crumbling around you. Maybe your family or friends are rejecting you. If you've ever felt rejected, cast out, alone, know this. Jesus understands. And he will not leave you that way. Verse 35. When Jesus heard that they had thrown this man out, and when he found him, when who finds him? When Jesus finds him. Don't miss this. This guy doesn't go looking for Jesus. Jesus goes looking for him. <laughs> He's the light of the world, the great I am, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he goes looking for this guy and he searches and he searches and he searches until he finds him. And when he does, Jesus, who knows that this guy's still spiritually blind, he asks one more question. He says, do you believe? Do you believe in the Son of Man? In the Greek, these words do you believe, are emphatic. Do you believe? Do you put your trust in the Son of Man? It's a title for the Messiah. Do you believe? And he says, who is he, sir? Tell me that I might believe. And Jesus replies in verse 37, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And with that, this man's spiritual eyes were opened wide, and he calls Jesus Lord. Lord. In verse 11, this blind man calls Jesus the man. In verse 17, he calls him a prophet. In verse 33, he calls him a man from God. But now in verse 38, with his spiritual eyes wide open, this man calls Jesus Lord. Lord. See, Lord is the word that the Jews used in the synagogue for God. You see, they couldn't speak the name of God, so they used the word Lord as a replacement. So this blind man finally comes to realize that Jesus, the one who loves him, the one who healed him, and this one who sought him out is Lord. He is Lord. So this man says, Lord, I believe. I believe. And then he falls to his face and he worships him. 
Let me ask you something. Why do people all around the world worship Jesus? Why do they pour their hearts out and lives to him? Why do they give their first and foremost to his kingdom? Why do they declare him Lord and Savior? Why do they do that? Because when Jesus, when he opens your eyes and you see him for who he really is, when you experience his love and grace and his healing, when your hearts are filled and your life is transformed, you can't help yourself. You can't help yourself. Other people may not want to believe it. They might doubt. But he is more than a man. He is more than a prophet. He is more than a man from God. He is Lord, Lord of all. And I don't know about you, but that's why I worship him. As I start to wrap up this morning, I'm going to ask that the band come up and just twinkle behind me. I don't know what to call it, you know. You know what I mean. I believe that Jesus sees us all. Each one of us in here this morning. And I believe we're here for a reason. Jesus sees our blindness and brokenness. Yet he doesn't blame us for it. Nor does he blame our parents. Instead, he simply says this morning that this has happened. Your blindness and brokenness has happened. It has happened that the work of God might be displayed in your life and mine. And then Jesus, he spits on the ground and he makes some of this mud, this healing salve, and he reaches up. He wants to reach up to you this morning and wipe it on whatever part of you that needs this healing. I'm going to ask us to close our eyes again, just as we started the service this morning. Now the cameras are going to be on me and no one else. Um, I want you to just take a moment to reflect. Is there an area of your life where you feel broken? Maybe you feel a crack inside. Maybe it's small. Or maybe it's an absolute chasm that feels like there can never be healing. Jesus wants to tell you this morning that there can be healing. Now, just like our story this morning, to activate this healing, we need to take a step of faith. Now, with all eyes closed and the cameras on me or elsewhere, if you feel this morning that you've got something you want God to work on, whether it's physical, spiritual, or emotional, I'm going to ask you to stand. No one's watching, just Jesus. Thank you. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for these brave people who have stood up this morning. Lord, they have taken that step of faith that you have asked from them this morning. And they are stepping towards you right now. Lord, I ask that you would work in their life. Lord, whatever area it is they feel a crack in or a chasm, whatever is going on, whether it is friends or family, whether it is emotional, spiritual, or physical, Lord, I ask right now that you would release your Holy Spirit into their lives, Lord Jesus. That you would come down now to meet with them afresh, Lord Jesus. 
Lord, only you can work in this way, Lord Jesus. You are the Lord of all in our lives. And right now, Lord Jesus, we are stepping towards you, Lord. We ask that you would spiritually illuminate yourself right now to us. That you would open our eyes if we need them, Lord God. That you would heal our heart if we need it. I ask that you would bless these people now. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Lord, bring a healing that only you can bring, Lord Jesus. It says in the Bible, by your stripes we are healed, Lord God. Lord, and we claim that all right now for these people standing up. Send your Holy Spirit down now, Lord Jesus. Let these people receive it, Lord God, afresh today. I'm going to ask those people standing to take a seat with everyone's eyes still closed. Lord, we thank you for the works you can do in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you want to meet us one on one. Lord, we thank you that when we are lost, you come and search and search and search until you find us, Lord Jesus. And it doesn't matter how big the crack or how small the crack is in our lives, that you want to heal us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you, Lord God. We praise your name. Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we worship, if you feel like you want some extra prayer, please do come up to the front. I'll be here and some other people as well. Um, so don't leave without getting some prayer if it's something you need.